Good afternoon. This is cloud security for Comp 422, Comp 620, Information Privacy and Security. Uh, semester is winding down. Oh, we got 13 people online and I'm all by myself here in McNair Hall. Uh, schedule. Today, we are going to talk about uh, cloud security and cybersecurity analysis tools, two different items. Uh, and then on Wednesday, two days from now, we'll do a review. And one week from today, is the final exam in this course. Uh, final exam will be all day. The usual format starts at 6 a.m. and you have until midnight to answer. So I'll be online. Uh, there is an assignment out there. You are to submit four questions suitable for the final exam. You wanna submit four good questions. Good questions will get a good grade. You may assume, therefore, that not so good questions, we'll get a not so good grade. Uh, and then we go, what's a good question? How do you know a good question when you see one? Well, of course, uh, it's gonna be appropriate to the course. It's gonna cover the material we covered in the class. I have a few questions that have already been submitted, some of which are very interesting questions, but I don't cover any material we covered in the class. Uh, now, I like questions that don't just ask you to tell me what I've told you. So don't make them multiple choice or true and false. Make them so that you have to use the information that you've learned in the class. And of course, they have to be on that fine line between being trivial and nearly impossible. And by the time midnight strikes on the day to come, they're all due on Blackboard. So please get them up there. Okay, today we're talking about cloud computing security. So let me talk a little bit about clouds. Uh, the whole concept of cloud computing is that instead of buying your own computer system, that you lease computational power from a cloud service provider or CSP, that you use their equipment instead of buying your own. That's pretty useful because computers are very expensive. I mean, yes, when you buy a computer for yourself, you can get a laptop, they're not terribly expensive, but if you're gonna buy a lot of big server equipment, it tends to run into a lot of money. Even more important than the capital expense of buying the equipment is hiring the staff to run it. You have to have experts to run it and keep it running smoothly. And of course you have to have experts to keep it secure. That would be you and you are expensive. Okay, so the cloud basically means Instead of doing your own computing, you hire a third party to run the systems for you. So there's all sorts of models. We'll talk about the different cloud infrastructure models in just a couple of minutes that they provide services for you. And so you run the system as if so much it's your system, but instead of owning it and in many cases, instead of managing it, you're hiring somebody else to do that, you're hiring experts. Also, there are several other advantages that we'll talk about coming up. Okay, you probably already use clouds quite a bit. Uh, the a and student email, you have a Google email, and just Google if you have Gmail and you go out and look at it on the web, well, that's a cloud system. In other words, you do not have your own web server. Instead, Google has these huge servers and they run them and allow you to access them over the web. In addition to just Google doing that, many other people, there are websites that are hosted on cloud services. Amazon Web Services, Google Web Pages, all sorts of these systems provide web servers that many companies use. So instead of running your own web servers, Many companies, particularly small companies who can't afford to keep the staff and keep it secure, will hire these cloud services to run their websites. And a single machine can run multiple web servers, web, multiple websites. Here's your standard get command from HTML. We've looked at this before. Now, this will be sent to the machine that is the web server for that site. You notice it says host. Uh, it's the host option, which used to be an option, but now is required. The host statement 
specifies what website are you trying to get to. It's because one machine may serve many different websites. And so this tells you which website that that server is supposed to be supporting. So when it gets this request, it's going to look for the www.acme.com slash mypage.html. Now it could be www.widgets.com and you want to get the widgets slash mypage.html. So it needs to know what site does this server supposed to be supporting. There are a lot of cloud servers out there, many cloud server providers, There's some huge ones. There's also many, many smaller ones. These are some of the bigger ones you may have seen. Uh, Amazon Web Servers, Microsoft's Azure, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, that's in China, Oracle. You see that the big players in computing are all out there as cloud services. Now, What's the, what's the big difference between a cloud and a system of your own? Basically, you're connecting to the cloud service through the internet. And as you might have figured out, if you've taken this course, that the internet is not always safe. There's a lot of possible things that can go wrong out there. So that is a danger that you add to the computing service when you have to access it over the web. And there's all sorts of problems, and we'll talk about those in just a few minutes. There are several advantages to clouds. Uh, one of them is elasticity. You know, what is that? That's the ability to expand and contract the resources that you're using. Okay, Black Friday was just last week. For many companies, Black Friday is a big day. Today is, today is Cyber Monday. All sorts of online services are expecting many more users than they normally see. If you have your own computer, then if you need to have sufficient resources to handle Cyber Monday, you might have much more hardware than you need on the days when you're not doing that sort of stuff. Some other time when it's a very slow period for your company, you have lots of hardware that's sitting there doing very little and you paid for it. With web services, you can buy the service and then as you need more and more services, it can expand to provide you more resources and capabilities to do what you need to do. And this can happen very quickly. Uh, there's also pay for what you use billing. When you buy your own hardware, you know, pay for it up front and you probably pay a lot of money. Whereas a pay for what you use billing, uh, you only have to pay for the resources that you use. So if you are not using a lot of resources, if your website's kind of slow, then you don't have to pay a lot. On the other hand, if you're really using the resources, if you have lots going on, then you might have to pay more. So a company may have to pay a larger bill in November because Cyber Mondays in November and a smaller bill perhaps uh, in March or something. One of the big benefits, of course, is because the servers are large, look at the companies that are providing the services, they're big, oh, that they can provide a lot of resources to a company when it needs it. Uh, backing up here, minute, let's look at those companies. Amazon Web Services. Amazon has a huge server farm because they have to have server capacity to run Amazon online shopping. And that requires an awful lot of, they, what do they do, a million dollars worth of business every minute? So need lots of servers. Likewise, Microsoft, as you might guess, has a lot of computers. So does IBM, so does Google. All these people have lots of computing resources. So they're just selling you their leftover computing resources. And again, as I mentioned, if you, bought the system yourself and went out and bought computers and hired good a and graduates to run the system, then you may have idle equipment during off periods. Also, if you want to scale up, it can happen with minutes, even seconds on some of these cloud services. Whereas if you need to buy a bigger computer, that can take weeks, maybe months to get a bigger computer on your floor. Okay, there are four different popular scenarios or models for cloud services. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and storage as a service. Each has this little acronym, and each one provides a different type of service to the company that needs the web service. 
Oh, okay, here's the model. Now at the bottom is your basic infrastructure as a service. That's just giving the machine. And then you can build on that where they provide you a platform as a service, which is infrastructure plus a platform. And then there's software as a service, which is all three. In other words, you have the infrastructure, the platform, and the software. Let's talk about all of these in some more detail. Okay, at the low end, you have infrastructure as a service. The basic concept of infrastructure as a service is that they provide you a machine. It's usually a virtual machine, of course, but it, it looks like you've got your own machine. And then your people, the company, does whatever they want to with it. You can load whatever operating system you want to, whatever software you want to on the system, but you run pretty much the whole thing. Uh, now, you don't control some aspects of it, such as some of the networking, but you pretty much have control over almost everything else. It's your operating system, your applications. You run the system. All, you, all the cloud service provider is giving you is something that looks like a piece of hardware. Stepping up from that is platform as a service. Platform as a service means the cloud service provider is going to give you a so it looks like hardware and an operating system and some software systems that you can use. In other words, they will give you a web server that you can do whatever you want to with. You have Java, you know, all the other languages and an operating system. You just have to write the applications that run on it. So this works real well if you have specific applications you need to run. So the consumer doesn't have to worry about the operating system. That's taken care of by the uh, cloud service provider, along with networks and files and stuff like that. Then there's software as a service. Software as a service is basically the cloud service provider provides certain services and you can run your programs on their service. This applies mostly for web servers. In other words, the cloud service provider provides a web server system. You just put your HTML pages out there and they show up on the web. You don't have to worry about how to run the web server, how to run the operating system, how to run the files, how to run the hardware. Cloud service provider takes care of all that stuff for you. So you don't have to worry about any of that sort of things. You just have to use the system that they provide. So you can see it's a growing layer of responsibility for the cloud service provider. Infrastructure, backing up, infrastructure as a service, all the cloud service provider provides something that looks like hardware. For platform as a service, they provide the hardware, an operating system, and maybe some background software. And then software as a service, they're providing everything. You just put the data out there. There's also storage as a service. This is a little bit step to the side from the others. The storage as a service is basically they're providing you mass storage, virtual disks. So you can rent space from a cloud service provider. And this can be used by individuals. You can have space. A lot of people have backup to uh, online cloud disks. So they can back their stuff up to that. And of course, not only do the service, should storage as a service providers, provide you a service. They may provide other things, balancing and backups for that. Here's a chart that kind of gives you some idea of what's happening over the many years. On the left here, we see, what if you owned all the equipment yourself? Well, you have to provide all the things. The green represents the things that you might have to provide. All the things from networking to the operating system, middleware uh, applications, you provide everything. Now, infrastructure is a service then the cloud service provider provides the, uh, not only the hardware, but the servers, the storage. You just, have, you just have to provide an operating system in the middle of all the other things. So you put the operating system out there, so you can run whatever operating system you like and run it on that server. Now, if you move up to platform as a service, then the cloud service provider is gonna provide the operating system, middleware. Middleware is things like uh, applications such as uh, SQL, uh, other things that aren't necessarily programs that you are going to run, but, but programs that your programs will need to run. And all you have to do for platform or service basically is provide the applications and the data. Whereas if you are doing software as a service, 
They're going to provide everything for you. Uh, it says here data, and that's a little confusing, perhaps. You have to provide your web content if it's a web server, which it often is. But that's about it. You may also provide some other uh, active components. But basically, you are just running your stuff on their system. I like this chart that I got from uh, bigcommerce.com that has pizza as a service, tries to give you the idea. On the left, you have a pizza that you're going to make at your house. And so you have to provide all that. You have to provide everything. You have to provide the dough, the, the cheese, the sauce, uh, everything else, the oven. Then yeah, what happens if you have you go to the grocery store and you buy a frozen pizza and bring it home? Well, in that case, the uh, vendor, the pizza manufacturer, provides the dough, the tomato sauce, the cheese, everything. You just have to provide the oven, the heat, uh, the drinks uh, to, uh, to serve it. If you have pizza delivered to your home, then uh, not only do they provide the pizza, but they cook it for you and bring it to your table. Uh, you just you just have to provide the table and uh, anything you want to drink. And again, dining out, which is that equivalent, by the way, to software as a service, they provide everything. They provide whole pizzas, they cook it, they bring it to your table. So they provide the table and everything. So you can see the difference that sort of maps the idea of the different services they have. Okay, so we have a, a question here. So let's put the poll out there. All right, let's uh, put your votes in. We have a tie. I can tell you one of the answers is right and others are wrong. Okay, we've got 70%, oh, 82%. Oh, thank goodness, a couple of people voted the right answer. Okay, anybody else out there? Yep, let's go. We'll give you five more seconds. Give me one minute. Okay. That's it. All right. See the results, I hope. Uh, it's pretty evenly distributed. Well, the right answer is D, or excuse me, C, C, infrastructure as a service. I can tell you, if you go out to any one of these cloud service providers, they do not provide IBM MVS operating system for you. That's ancient. As an ancient guy myself, I can tell you, I've used IBM MVS and it's gone the way of the dinosaur. So, uh, so if you want to run MVS, you're going to have to get infrastructure as a service. That is, you will hire somebody or a cloud service provider to give you a virtual machine into which you will boot your version of IBM MVS, and then you will run your application on top of that operating system, because nobody out there is going to provide you with an IBM MVS operating system. At least I don't think so. Maybe they do, but I, I don't imagine that they will. Okay, so. Now, when you bought your own hardware without using a cloud, bought your own system, uh, and basically you ran uh, whatever applications you have on the operating system that you decided to use. Applications that didn't run your operating system didn't run generally. Now there was an advantage here that each application could get a significant amount of the system resources, but it also meant that at times some of the resources were underutilized. University computers where I used to work, or the systems got pretty busy in the afternoon, tapered off in the evening, and then around 4 a.m. they were pretty darn idle and very few people were using them. Where the cloud service provider balancing it is their problem. There are virtual machines now. A lot of people are using virtual machines, very common. They've been around for quite some time. 
I can tell you I used IBM VM370 in the late 70s, early 80s. It was an interesting system, okay? It is a virtual machine system uh, by IBM. When a user logged on to the virtual machine, when you entered your user ID and password, it automatically booted up a small operating system called CMS, conversational monitoring system or whatever. Uh, yes, and so, and that gave you the uh, user display and the interface that you thought of as the system, but in fact, it was this little bitty operating system that each person ran in their own virtual machine. Your virtual machine had what they called mini disks. It looked to the little, little operating system like a disk, but in fact, it was just a couple tracks on a real hard drive. Uh, the virtual machine looked like a real machine. There were a couple of things that were slightly different the virtual machines that you ran, the CMS, did not do any paging. The virtual machines all thought they had lots and lots of memory. Well, lots and lots of memory in those days was 16 gigabytes. Uh, megabytes, oh, sorry, 16 megabytes. Yes, 16 megabytes, because two to the 24 is 16 million, and they had 24-bit addressing. So they had, thought they had 16 million addresses. What they thought was lots and lots of address space. In fact, they didn't have that much, but the underlying uh, virtual machine, the control program, handled all the page faults and handled paging between each machine. Uh, so everybody ran their own virtual machine. And typically you could boot up CMS, but you could also boot up whatever other operating system you thought you needed. We ran an application that required one of these ancient operating systems. So that one booted up the ancient operating system and ran the application for the library that they needed. We now have all sorts of virtual machine systems that are out there running. You've probably seen VMware, VirtualBox, and there's several others that you can run on your laptop or PC, and they provide a virtual machine. Now, these things like VMware and VirtualBox provide virtual hardware. It makes it look like a, a hardware device. Typically, of course, VMware and VirtualBox provides an operating system for you to run, or if you have a license, they will run that operating system. The there are other virtual machines. One that comes to mind is the platforms for running certain systems, like the Java virtual machine, the .NET virtual machine. These are execution virtual machines. These do not simulate hardware. They just provide a execution uh, environment that's usually platform independent. That's the big thing about Java. You're supposed to be able to write it once and run it everywhere or write once and test everywhere. Again, these become widely used. A lot of people are using virtual machines. They provide good isolation between uh, the users. There's not total isolation. If you have two virtual machines and on one of the virtual machines, the users decide to calculate the value of pi up to 10 million digits, they're gonna start using a lot of CPU. That may have an impact on the CPU availability of the other virtual machines. But generally, one virtual machine can't impact the other virtual machine. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Also, because they're virtual machines, you can scale them dynamically. Whereas it may appear that you have one CPU, the underlying virtual machine system may spread that out across multiple machines so you have lots of computing resources. So virtualization is one of the big technologies for cloud computing. They can provide all sorts of imaginary virtual machines out there that abstract either the hardware or the hardware in the operating system, or middleware, all sorts of, depending on which one of those cloud models you want to use. And again, they can expand, there's elasticity. Whereas if you need more resources, it can give you more resources, sometimes automatically, sometimes under request, but you can get more computing resources as you need them. There are security issues involved in cloud computing. If there weren't security issues, why would I be talking about them today? 
There's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And you've probably seen these CIA letters before in this class. They are important in cloud computing. Confidentiality means that all the customers can be assured that their information is not being leaked out to anybody else that it keeps their information secure so nobody else can see them. Integrity, which is very similar, means not only can that seem, but they can't change it. Nobody's gonna be able to tamper with their data. If you keep your hardware in a locked room, that used to be the standard. Everybody had their own uh, computer center and it was guarded and locked. Where I used to work, you had to put your card in the door, type in your code, walk in past the uh, human operator, uh, and at least one of those will catch you if you weren't the right person. So now, let to make sure this works. And of course, availability is important. Many of these cloud systems provide redundancy. So in case some of the hardware fails, it'll keep on running and your application won't even notice. Okay, so we have another question here for, for you to see if you're awake. Okay, oh, almost everybody's voted. So what's the right answer? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I think all the above has some, no. A is probably not always correct. Almost always cloud servers use virtual machines. Not always, but they may. They may just give you access to the machine that they're managing. They're used by corporations, not usually by individuals. That's probably true. Although you do use, uh, cloud services when you run Gmail or your Aggie email, so it's a cloud service, generally support multiple users in one machine. Well, that is definitely true. That is, cloud services almost always support multiple users in one machine. So, see you everybody like, everybody like you. Of course, we're not grading this. Wait till next week, we'll start grading things. Oh, yeah, I think you see the answers there. Share results, okay. Done sharing results. Uh, so the big question is what is so different between having clouds and having a traditional computer system, particularly in the aspect of computer security? What do you notice that's different when having a cloud system as opposed to having a big computer center in a locked room? Well, one of the big ones is that you're relying on somebody else to do your security, to maintain your system and keep your system secure. Typically, it is the cloud service providers, uh, people that their experts are doing the security for you. You may do some security yourself, but they're also a big part of it. So you're relying on somebody else to do it for you. Who knows who these administrators are? Are particularly if you have very sensitive data, are they? allowed to have access to the sensitive data. Say you're running a government agency or your own agent, own information, and you're trying to keep very sensitive information. Do the administrators on the cloud service, they could probably access that information. But you have to make sure that they, that you can live with that risk. Now, of course, the cloud service provider will tell you how trustworthy, really well, helpful, and friendly that they are, but you have a risk there that you cannot manage as easily as if you're hiring your own people. Now, of course, if you hire your own people, somebody may go rogue and start selling your information anyway, but at least you have some greater layer of protection. One of the things you can do to help protect yourself is encrypt your data. 
So even though the cloud service provider administrators can see the system, they won't know what they're looking at. There are several uh, challenges for cloud security. Uh, cloud account hijacking, that's where uh, somebody gets your cloud account information, phishing is the common way to do it, and starts hacking into your system. Uh, you don't always see as a company what is going on with your, your system, even because it's not your system, it's a third party system. Your people may not be familiar with the tools used by the cloud service provider. They may have cloud security tools, which they use, and your people may not be particularly knowledgeable in those. You have to watch out about tracking the data, uh, where it is, when they say in transit at rest, and the rest is where it's being stored, transit as it's going across the network. And you have to worry about how secure is the cloud service. And then there's multi-tenancy concerns. That's two reasons. Let's talk about some of those. Okay, here's a model uh, where down at the bottom, this is the cloud service providers stuff that they provide. And ab above here are all the different customers that run on that cloud. So external threats or threats from the outside that come in threatening customers. There's guest to guest threats. That is one customer on the cloud has the potential of inter interacting in a malicious way against another customer. And then there's cloud to guest, that is something about the cloud that attacks the guests, the companies that are using the cloud. And then there's the ability for the companies to actually attack the cloud. So it can go in all different directions. Oh. So external threats are things we pretty much talked about before. These are where somebody from outside the cloud is attacking your system on the cloud. So if you have www.acme.com is running on uh, Microsoft Azure, and somebody is attacking that system on the Microsoft uh, cloud service. And pretty much external threats for cloud systems, the same things you saw for non-cloud systems. So they're not really much different. Okay, guest to cloud threats. Those are uh, where the guest can interact in a malicious way with the cloud, with the cloud service provider's system. Now you're attacking the cloud infrastructure. trying to make the cloud system un unstable as would impact other users. Guest to cloud, some more guest to clouds. Uh, the cloud service provider is using virtual machines and most of them do. They have to make sure that the VM image, that is the image of the operating system of the virtual machine that gets loaded into the virtual machine simulator uh, cannot be changed by a user. If an attacker, uh, yeah, either, another virtual machine or an external attacker modifies the virtual machine image, they can do so and start create all sorts of problems. If they were to change the operating system or the applications in a malicious way, then it's not gonna work well at all for you. So they also refer to that as hyperjacking, where you're going out there and change the hypervisor or the cloud service provider system. Now cloud to guest threats go in the other direction where the cloud service provider is attacking the users, the, uh, the customers, that is the companies that are using the cloud service. Sometimes you have to get your nomenclature correct. We have the cloud service provider. We will talk about the companies who are using the cloud. And then you have users that are customers of the companies and then the companies are customers of the cloud service provider. So if your cloud service provider is not 100% up and up, then they might have people out there that are doing things that can pose a threat to the guest, to your data. And then there's the problem of in, insecure interfaces. Now, a lot of these cloud service providers do a lot, provide a lot of their services through APIs, application program or interfaces. They're often accessed through the web where you 
send a request to what looks like a web page. It's got a address and a function. You send it off there and it executes that and returns a value. If you've written HTML applications that go out and get a JSON page from a web server, that's exactly what we're talking about. It accesses an API, goes out there, gets the information, returns it back to your website, and then your web browser displays it and does whatever it wants to with it. Another question for you to think about. Just a second, let me see if I can. Okay, hang on, here we go, let's go ahead. Okay, sorry, here we go. Apologize with fumble fingers, not quite clicking the system as they ought to. All right, anybody else want to put their vote in? Okay, if not, we'll just. Oops. Okay, 75% uh, of the people voted true, which is kind of what I was thinking true. Uh, anybody who voted false going to speak up for why false might be correct? Is that the way the coin landed? Uh, so, okay, uh, yes, almost all the things we've talked about in this class about uh, computer security, they all apply to web security. There's just a few other things for web security that you have to worry about that you don't have to worry about in non-web security systems or non-cloud systems. Okay, just a minute. Let me... And then I want to talk at last just a little bit about storage as a service. Storage as a service is where a cloud service provider simply provides mass storage space, disk space, if you will, for individuals or businesses. So instead of having to provide all the mass storage themselves, along with the backups and other balancing that you have a storage as a service provider doing all that for you. That they provide mass storage. And of course, they usually provide huge quantities of it. They usually have lots and lots of space. It's usually uh, redundant so that if a piece of hardware fails, it just keeps on going. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to buy it. You just rent the service from them. And they take care of the whole thing. And again, uh, this is available for individual users. You can uh, use that to put your information. Uh, Microsoft has a system that they allow you use. Um, Microsoft Cloud Service, which I can't remember right now, but I'm going to figure it out in just a minute because we're going to quit this slides and... Okay, uh, but Microsoft provides this service for users. You can put your files up there, access them anywhere. All right, that was enough for first topic for today, which was cloud security. The next topic for today is cyber analysis tools. These were of course the topics that you voted on. Uh, okay, just a moment, let's go back to... Uh, and share the screen. We'll try, no, we'll try this. Okay. There you are. Hopefully everybody can see the screen now. Oh, security analysis tools. All right. 
an important announcement here. I have sent everyone an email that gave a summary of your grades for the course. And at the end, told you what kind of grades you have to get to get a better, what kind of score you have to get on the final in order to get a better grade in the class, what kind of score you might get on the final. It'll drag your grade down to something worse. It also says whether you are exempt from the final or whether you are required to take the final. If it says you're required to take the final, well, it's pretty obvious you're required to take the final. If you don't, you get a zero on the final, and that's 20% of your grade. Most of you cannot afford 20%. Even if you have 100 going into the final, it gives you down to an 80. That's low grade. So you're required to take it. Got to do that Monday, a week from today. But if you are exempt, if you are exempt, you have a choice. You may still take the exam if you want to. If you can take the exam and try to improve your grade. Of course, if you have an A, then there's nowhere going up, so I wouldn't worry about it. But if you have something less than an A, you can take the final exam in hopes of getting a better grade. Or if you don't take the final exam, you can just not take it and you'll get the grade that the grade summary says you already have so far. So if the grade summary says you have a B and you choose to not, and it says you are exempt, then you don't take the final, you will get the B. Now, I might point out, because somebody always asks, if you are exempt, but you take the final and you get a miserable grade, uh, does that mean you get a worse grade? The answer to that is yes, sadly. It's very rare. I've, you know, I've been teaching this, this sort of stuff for 30 years, and I've been doing this sort of thing for years and years. And typically, almost nobody who takes the exam at the end. Now, when we used to have paper exams, if somebody felt they were really doing poorly, they would just stand up, put the exam in their binder, and walk out and wave, and just not turn the exam in. I suppose if you are exempt from the final and you make an attempt at it, and you look at it and you get the end and you go, I don't like this, you can just press the cancel button on Blackboard and not take it. You didn't take it. But if you want to take it, you can go for it and see if you can get a better grade. Now, typically, I marked you exempt because the score that you have to get in order to improve your grade is higher than any exam score you have received this semester. So me, it says, yeah, it's not very likely you're going to get that. Now, I am not intending to make the final exam extremely hard. The final exam will be cumulative. It covers material from the whole semester. Also, I mentioned that the grade summary I sent to you does not include your score for the four final exam questions because four final exam questions are not due to tomorrow night and I haven't graded them yet. I have looked at a couple of them and I sent somebody an email saying, you better improve this because it's not gonna get a good grade. A couple of the others, violated some of the rules of multiple choice. I think I said no multiple choice. If your qu four questions include multiple choice questions, you might want to consider going out there and uh, uploading better set of questions. You can do that. You know, you've already uploaded yours and uh, you realize now that, oh, that's not going to get a good grade. You can try again. I will take everybody's questions and make them available to the whole class. So I'm just going to merge them all together I may remove some questions that I would never use. Again, some people send questions that have nothing to do with this class. I don't know why you thought that would be a good question, but people send questions that have nothing to do with Comp 620. Uh, sometimes nothing to do with computer science. Uh, I will not put those on the final and I won't put them on the summary of questions. All right, but that's enough of that. Let's talk about cyber analysis tools. Unless anybody has questions, any questions about the final exam or the exemptions? Okay, there's still a bunch, same number of people uh, who we started with this, this afternoon. So typically by the time I, I did this with paper back in the old days, I would hand out pieces of paper to everyone. And those students who saw they were exempt from the final exam would stand up, wave and walk out of class because they're done. All right, I went out, I, I hate to admit, I don't know where I got this list of cybersecurity analysis tools, which I've edited quite a bit, but uh, I don't remember who. So I'm pirating from somebody who I don't even know. But here's a list. 
interesting thing to look at about this list is that we only covered some of them. We covered antivirus software, we covered firewalls, talked about encryption quite a bit, we talked a little bit about pen testing. You did that when you tried to log into the system where you did have a password. You will not talk too much about the other four items, and I'm going to do that now. Although I'm not going to talk too much about network security monitoring tools. Uh, there are a wide number of tools out there for you to use. If you want to know more about network security monitoring tools, then you should take Dr. Shu's course, Comp 726 Network Security. And they talk about network security uh, in great detail. And since they talk about it in great detail, to avoid overlap in our graduate security courses, I'm not going to cover it in much detail at all. But I will tell you some of the popular tools. One of them is Nmap or Network Mapper. Uh, it's free open source. Oh, by the way, the, th the three tools that I'm going to mention, uh, Nmap, Snort, and Bioshock, are all freely available. You can all get them for free. Uh, Nmap is open source. You can get it out there. Nmap goes out and scans computers. It goes out there and will look at an individual computer, or you can give it a whole range of addresses and it scans them all. It goes out there and sees which ports are open. Uh, whether does this thing support a web page? What, what web services does it provide? What ports on the machine? Ports, of course, being uh, TCP or UDP uh, numbers. They're not physical things. What ports are in use? What can you access on this machine? I found Nmap to be particularly useful to run it on your own system. I have a couple of computers at home, and I sit there and I run Nmap and see how vulnerable my wife's system, system is. So it tells me what ports they've got to open, and maybe I should go out there and close a couple of these if they're not being used. Here's a report that you get back from that. I copy this from the uh, nmap.org website, and it's one of their systems. Uh, First thing you can see is that uh, it is the an Nmap uh, website. Uh, 995 ports closed. That means of all the ports they scanned, there were a whole bunch of them that didn't do anything, that would, didn't respond. Port 22, which is a uh, secure shell access, uh, it's on port 22, runs down TCP. That's available. You can see the details. It's running open SSH level 3.1 P1. And uh, they've got a web server, an Apache web server out there running. They've got an LDP uh, I've got, and a couple other services out there. Uh, this one, NPing Echo, that's a service provided by Nmap because this is an Nmap machine, they run it there. And it tells you it's running a Unix system 2.6 point something service. So it gives you a lot of information about the system. It's pretty useful if you can run it on your system and find out what ports are available and you go, oh, that's available, I should go out there and configure my operating system to close that port. It's very easy to say, no, we're not going to support that port. And therefore, you can't get attacked. Remember that each open port increases your vulnerability, your attack surface. Snort is another popular tool. Uh, it's an intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention. It does real-time traffic analysis. You run Snort on your network and it goes out there and looks at everything going across the network. Uh, you can provide a whole bunch of rules. The Snort website has rule sets that you can download and create your own. And if some packets or a bunch of network traffic matches the rules that you have, it will generate an alert. An alert can be either pop up a message in Snort or send you an email or whatever it is. It will form you that something's happening that you have written a rule to check for. Uh, Snort is free, although you can also get the purchase version of it. The purchase version provides you with more rules, uh, I think support and other things. I'm not really sure I don't sell Snort, so you have to go to the website and find out, but it's, you can get the free version or you can get the purchase version. Wireshark is a packet sniffer. Wireshark will scan all the packets coming across your network. You can filter them by all sorts of criteria and let you see what happens. Shows you the nitty gritty detail of what's going across your network. It shows you all the packets and it'll display that in nice format because it knows the protocols of practically every network protocol I've ever imagined. And it will show you what it means. So say you wanted to see the 
HTTP packets going to a particular website. Well, you can put those filters out there and we'll show you those. You can look carefully at all the packets going back and forth and see what they're doing and what's happening for each, each packet. Okay, so that's Wireshark. Uh, and Wireshark is particularly useful if you're into networks and you want to see just what is the network doing. Let me talk a little bit about uh, Wi-Fi encryption. There are several Wi-Fi encryption protocols that Wi-Fi encryption has had a sad history. They came out with Wired Equivalent Privacy, WEP, back in 97. And that lasted, what, six years, which is probably 5.9 years longer than it should have. It was not very good. Well, when they started this back in 97, they were all worried that computers and Wi-Fi interfaces were not very powerful. A number of things have improved quite a bit in the last 30 years. I know, I was there. And so they used this miserable protocol that did not, <laughs> just didn't work very well. Dr. Yuan used to have a network security course that she ran and she, one of the labs she'd have, she'd come into class, she'd invite everybody with a wireless access point and they'd all break into it. They're all using wired, equivalency privacy, WP security, and then you break into it. So it's kind of interesting. Yes, there it is. And you can break right into it in class. So uh, since then, there's Wi-Fi wi protected access, WPA, and that has gone through some way. It came out in 2003. It was what replaced WEP. And then they fixed it again in 2004. It didn't, that didn't last long. And then in 2003, they came out, oh, excuse me, 2018, they came out with WPA, and that uses, it, you, oh, well, here, oh, look at this line here. It's got all sorts of acronyms, and fortunately, you should know what all those acronyms mean. It uses AES-256. Well, that's the advanced encryption standard. We talked about encryption. That's a symmetric encryption system, AES. The 256 means it's using 256-bit keys. AES runs 128, 196, Oh, 190. Let's get this right. It runs on 128, 192, or 256 bit keys. So, 256 bit keys is the largest keys, and it goes to more iterations of the algorithm to really scramble up your data. So, it does that. It uses GCM mode. That's the Galios counter mode. It's a stream encryption mode. We talked about that. We talked about encryption modes. And then it uses SHA-384. That's a standard hash algorithm. The dash 384 means it's a 384-bit result because the hash algorithm looks at all, looks at the packet that you're sending across the Wi-Fi, uh, creates a hash, and attaches that at the end. It's a HMAC. That's a hashed message authentication code. Not only does it create the uh, SHA-384 uh, message of code, but it then uh, encrypts it so that the receiving side will know that it has been uh, falsified. So it's encrypted, it's signed, and, uh, and so that makes it quite secure. And we feel that AES is pretty secure. If somebody breaks AES, we're all in trouble. Uh, the network that uses all these things, that use W. You have to use the WPA3 uh, protection algorithms in order to be Wi-Fi certified. There's a little Wi-Fi certified logo that you might have seen some places. In order to use the logo, you have to use WPA3. You can't use any of the earlier ones. You got to be secure. So here's a question I've got for people who haven't talked about this. You just have to figure it out on your own. The concept here is that you're shopping on Amazon at Starbucks and you're using the Starbucks website. Well, Starbucks is usually encrypted, but some unencrypted website at a coffee shop.
Some people are slow to answer. They must, uh, must be exempt from the final. They've gone home. Okay. Well, here's the results. You can see 82% of the people voted all of the above, which is incorrect. 18% uh, of the people said, can determine that you visited Amazon website. There's a lot of people that are kind of crazy about, oh, you can't run over an unencrypted Wi-Fi. Well, yes, you can. It's not as dangerous as they'd like you to think. Uh, Wi-Fi access points may or may not be encrypted. If it's not encrypted, there's all sorts of higher level encryption. In particular, HTTPS encrypts everything going across that connection. So once it's encrypted, the attacker who's viewing all the packets going across, everything's encrypted and they can't decrypt it. So they do know where they're going. They can see what website you're connecting to. They can see uh, where it came from. Well, they can say it's you. They can see what protocol you're using. Are you using UDP or TCP? Well, that doesn't tell you a lot. You're using TCP. They say, well, you're using TCP because HTTPS and virtual provide transport layer security, TLS. And TLS is that the transport layer of networks. So you can see everything below that. You can see the network layer. The network layer has this information. Where is it going? Where is it coming from? What protocol is it going to use the next highest layer? But you can't see any of the data on that layer because that's all encrypted by HTTPS or a virtual private network. So there seems to be a lot of hysteria going on about uh, unencrypted websites. Uh, so the previous answer, the answer was A, determine that you visited the Amazon website. Yes, that is the correct answer. Because if it's encrypted uh, at, using HTTPS, even though the lower level encryption is not there, even if you're not using WAP3, which you should be using, then they can't see your user ID and password because that's going to be encrypted by HTTPS. They can't, they can't change your order because that's protected by HTTPS. Okay. All right, another cybersecurity feature is managed detection and response. Managed detection and response is basically a company that you could hire. You can hire uh, MDR companies for their services and they will manage your security. So if you don't have properly trained staff, in other words, if they don't have an Aggie graduate on their staff, then they may need to hire a company to do their security for them. So the MDRs company monitors their system, uh, works with them, and takes care of that aspect of their IT service. So they do security. Services. Basically, managed detection response is your hiring a contractor to do your security for you. Okay, web vulnerability scanning tools. There are a whole bunch of tools out there that will scan your website and tell you if you've got likely security problems. And they look for the usual things, cross-site scripting, you know, all the vulnerabilities, SQL injection, command injection, things we've talked about in this class. Actually, many of these we talked about in web security, Comp 621. Uh, and you can run these tools either uh, externally or on your own system. Uh, I'm going to try it now. Okay, let's, we're going to get out of here. Let's just click this silly pointer thing to go away. Uh, maybe. And click on that. Oh, do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to, I want to close this. Uh, Okay, we're going to switch screen sharing over to the website. All right, here we are. Can and you, can you uh, put that link in the chat so we could try it? Sure, I think it's on the, uh, yes, I'll do that. Hang on, uh, let me start this up. This takes a minute. Okay, I'm going to try scanning the class website because it's, over here. The class website does not use HTTPS. Uh, there it is, and I'll start this up. So now 
My website is being scanned. Why that's happening, by the way, let me go back, uh, grab that URL. and put that in the chat. There, you can try it on your own websites or whatever website you like to try it on. Here we go. Oh, it's done. Okay, it didn't take very long because it's not a very, whoops, let's view that report, please. There we go. I have one medium level risk, six low level risks and 12 pieces of information. Okay, let's take a look at them. Uh, the, Medium level one is that it uses HTTP and not HTTPS. Well, I knew that. That was a feature that I didn't buy. So HTTP is good enough for me in that system. Uh, again, I purchased that. So actually, I didn't purchase it. I used the free version. I decided to pay for some money. I could have gotten HTTPS, but I didn't, didn't pay that kind of money. Uh, and then there's several things about the headers and the cookies. If you took Comp 621, or maybe even Comp 725, you'll understand these things. These are uh, options in your headers for the HTTP that you might want to do that provides uh, security against them. In other words, the content security policy prevents uh, cross-site scripting. The referrer policy helps prevent uh, other problems. We've got content type options, yes. Several things that we don't do, X-frame options. These will prevent cross uh, click jacking and other issues. And also the web server tells you what kind of operating system it is running the web server. This is the uh, service I provide. This is infinity free app. Infinity free as the name implies is free. And so I just use what I got. There's a whole bunch of things that weren't problem. There was all these things didn't happen. And um, so these were not issues. So that was an online scan. Again, it was free. You just go out there, put in your favorite URL. I might point out that uh, it takes longer for big websites. I, my website is not very long. It just has the stuff we've used in exams and, and assignments. Whereas if you're going to go out there and say Google Wikipedia, it's going to take a while because Google B Wikipedia is huge. Okay, I'm going to close this. Oh, whoops. Let's go back to. Uh, uh, just a second. Let's try that. Okay. You're seeing the wrong thing. You're seeing my website here. Not the particular. Oh, well, there's only like one more slide, so never mind. Uh, application security testing. We talked a little bit about this before. There are static tools that look at the source code of your application and tell you if there are potential vulnerabilities. Uh, I don't remember the name of the ones we used, but I had some that I ran on my PHP program. So I looked at them and said, oh, this is vulnerable for uh, injection, SQL injection. It was not very accurate in the version I ran. It had lots of false positives. It was taking numbers that I got back from error codes, putting them into error messages, and then telling me there might be uh, Inje injection problems. Well, I don't think the error code number is going to produce an injection problem. Then there's dynamic application security testing. And those run the program. Basically, they run the application, which will also be a web application. And they will run it remotely and access it and test for all sorts of things. They'll test for all sorts of issues. They'll try SQL injection. They'll try all the nasty stuff that we've talked about and see if any of those can be done and see if it works. The best thing you can do, of course, is use both of them run these tools against the software and use some of the tools that you can get to do it dynamically and see how your web systems run. Uh, 
Okay, once again, an assignment is out there. It's due tomorrow night by midnight. Uh, you gotta put four questions out there. If you, the, if you're in a good question, gets a good grade. If you're not so good question, gets a not so good grade. Oh, there's four questions. These questions were 25 points. Um, it has to be pertinent to the class material. If you ask questions about stuff that's not part of the class, then you're not gonna get a grade. Um, let's see what else. Oh, no multiple choice, no true and false. If anybody's ever seen Bloom's Taxonomy, Bloom's Taxonomy written years ago and explains how you might, how you should teach those different levels of teaching. As you can say, these are the things you have to memorize. Just all I ask is that you be able to repeat them back to me. And there's different levels of synthesis, and at some of the top levels, you have to use the information. You have to create new stuff. You have to use that information and not analyze it and create new information. That's the kind of questions we want here. And of course, shouldn't be trivial. Shouldn't be impossible. Remember that the final exam is Monday, December 5th. This is not the day that's in the university final exam schedule. University final exam schedule says Friday. No. Final exam is not going to be that day. It's going to be all day Monday. Again, it'll open up 6 a.m. and it'll close at midnight. If you are exempt from, from the final, in other words, if I said you're exempt, then you don't have to submit the questions because they're not going to be counted. If, though, you are not exempt and you have better submit those questions, because most students get a pretty good grade, assuming. Not everybody gets 100. I might tell you, this is not an easy, everybody gets 100. If you submit good questions, you'll get a good grade, and that can help your score. Uh, if you submit bad questions, then it might not help your score, but they, it is a required assignment if you're not exempt. If you're exempt from the core, from the final, then you're pretty much done for the semester. We will have a review on Wednesday, and we'll go back over things. Uh, and sometime between now, well, sometime shortly after Tuesday at midnight, it does not mean 12.01, it means like sometime Wednesday morning, more like Wednesday afternoon, I will take all the questions that you provided, throw out the ones that are ridiculous, and put them out on the Blackboard website so everybody can see what kind of questions. And I'll probably use a couple of them. So if you look at all the questions and make you understand them all, then you know, good study tool. There will be no practice final. Well, looking at the questions is the practice enough. Are there any last minute questions before we? Call it quits for today. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, if you're exempt or if you're exempt from the final and already turned in the um, homework assignment, would it be graded or can I still be exempt for that homework you're assignment? You're still as well? exempt. In fact, okay. I, I, if you're exempt, why should I bother grading it? You know, I got there's 60, there's 64. Three students in this class, that's a lot of stuff to grade. My TA and I don't want to grade more than we have to. So we do not want to grade material from exempt students. Thank you very much. Now, if you're exempt, but you intend to take the final, then you better turn in the questions because I'm going to use all the information to compute your final grade. So even though you may be exempt, if you're going to take the final, unless of course you choose at the very end to bail out and press the cancel button and just leave. But otherwise, yes, if you take the final, then you need to do the four questions because that will be part of your grade. That's a good question. Any other questions about questions? Um, do you want us to have like the questions and the answer or just the question? Just the questions. Although you would be a fool not to know the answer because it may appear on the final. And if you ask a question, I think, oh, that's a wonderful question. And I put it on the final and you don't know the answer. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? <laughs> you deserve to be fooled. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to tell me the answer. If I can't figure out the answer, I'm not gonna put it on the exam. But it would be smart for you to know what the answers are. Don't tell anybody else. Okay, any other questions about the questions? No? Well, for many of you, this is it. Uh, if you are planning on taking the final, I will see you Wednesday and we'll review for the final. If you are not planning on taking the final, then you don't need to review for the, for the final and you are done for the semester. Very good. Nice having you. Uh, 
I won't see you next semester, but maybe some other time. Good luck in the rest of your finals. Thanks, bye. Thank you. So we don't have to take the questions. I mean, the answers to our questions on that, uh, for the homework.